there, I'm the GD&T guy, and you are on video eight, maybe the last of a deep dive into a somewhat niche topic in the world of mechanical design, engineering drawings, and geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, otherwise known as GD&T. If you like what you hear, please like and subscribe so you get the rest of these in your feed. Please also comment with your agreements and disagreements and help me identify any mistakes I've made. And in the video descriptions, I will post a link to where you can find PDFs of all the drawings I discuss so you can pause and look at them yourself. Okay, let's go. This video series started with a very popular way to locate parts using dowel pins. It's gone into a lot of detail of mechanical design, machined parts, and the tolerances we apply on engineering drawings. Honestly, if you're just joining this now, you might want to go back to the earlier videos because we are pretty deep into it at this point. In the last video, I told you I think dowel pins, which I like and I use in my designs, are nevertheless overused in industry. Let me show you an example of that overuse that I see pretty often with this flange part. We would call this geometry rotationally symmetric. Plus it has a pattern of bolt holes and a couple of pins in the face. To me, this seems like pins for the sake of pins. They must be intended to align this flange with another flange or something similar. Maybe they're also intended to take a shear load. I have this as drawing GDTG 00412, which we can certainly dimension in tolerance, but I don't recommend this design. Instead, have a look at this drawing, GDTG 00413, which has no pins. To locate the next flange, it has a largish cylindrical feature coaxial to the other features on the part. The next flange would have like an internal feature that fits over this one. These features can be made to a high degree of accuracy on the lathe. And I have to imagine that this joint would have a very high shear strength depending on the material. And I guess I just feel like this is readily available to you given the geometry of the part and would be a great locating feature as opposed to the pin features, which would have to be machined on the mill in a whole different setup along with the bolt holes. Notice that this hole call out, this part really, does not have a tertiary datum to constrain it in rotation. If you're nervous about this, don't be. We all know how this would work in assembly. You'd put the two flanges together on the locating features, and then you rotate one of them until the screw holes line up sufficient to pass screws through them. But there may be some occasions to reintroduce a pin. Let's have a look at this drawing, GDTG 00414. Here I'm using a pin as a clocking feature, along with my flat surface as a primary datum and my 1.315 feature as a locating feature. The next flange that attaches to this one must have a slot corresponding to the pin. One reason I might do this is to position this additional piece of tubing that branches off at a right angle here. This might be something that helps me put together my assembly. But I would just caution you, as I have before in this series, that once this pin is in here, this joint is locked up. Depending on our fabrication method, there may be only so tight we can go with the location of this tube. I mean, probably it's welded on. So when we add this part to the assembly, wherever this little tube stub ends up being, that's it. There's no ability to loosen the screws on the flange, and rotate this thing a little to get that branch in the right position. I guess an alternative approach would be to get rid of the pin and use some rotational slots for the screw holes, right? Changing gears, here's an interesting way I've seen dowel pins used in the context of a circular hole pattern. This would give you some polka yoke functionality, ensuring that the only way this can be reasonably assembled is with the angle surface and one orientation. I'm trying to understand why I have mixed feelings about this one. Maybe I shouldn't. The drawing for the detail part with the pins is GDTG 00417. This one has a few feats of view selection and dimensioning. It helps in keeping this drawing neat that the pins are so perfectly placed within this circular hole pattern. I still feel like I need to have this 0 .4700 basic dimension here. Maybe it could be reference. I got a little stumped on this one. With these dimensions, I'm aiming for neatness, but I don't want to perpetuate a falsehood that the XYZ origin of this interface is like at the center of the pattern. 
No, it's where the datum n axis intersects datum m. I chose to do the section view through the pins and also to put this pin to pin reference dimension to emphasize this. In these feature control frames, datum p is referenced as tertiary and translating. That translation would have to be in the direction toward and away from datum n, not like towards the center of this pattern. All right, so now let's have a look at GDPG00419, which is the mating part. Here again, I've oriented my views pretty carefully to show the relationships between these features. You can see the datum C slot is oriented toward the datum B hole. A lot of this dimensioning is similar to the previous part, and there should be a number of by now familiar looking techniques for tolerancing the hole and the slot, and then using them in a datum reference frame. All right, let's look at another one. I've been seeing this interface used by engineers when they're trying to account for differential thermal expansion of parts made of two different materials. I'm a little bit skeptical of this one. First of all, it's a real risk of over constraint with the three pins and three slots. And like I showed in the last video, with the example of two pins going into two holes, we can only get away with it to the extent that we make the locating features, in this case the slots, larger. Thermal expansion is a relatively small effect, especially like differential thermal expansion. There's no way that these slots need to be this long, okay? Maybe all the motion takes place within that clearance and these slots don't really do much to guide the differential expansion. My next thought has to do with these stacks of conical spring washers and there's some standoffs in here too. You know, a torqued screw can generate hundreds of pounds of preload. And this whole idea of the slots guiding the differential expansion seems to rest on the idea that the bolted joints are gonna slip. If that's actually what's happening, if we had a lot of preload on these screws, it would make that slipping chaotic and uneven. For those reasons, I feel a little bit better about this one if I'm dramatically reducing the preload and also reducing the friction between these two parts by making them flat and smooth. So that's a bunch of design stuff. Let's go into the drawing for the part with the pins. GDPG 00418. On this one, I give a 2000th position tolerance to locate the three pins as a pattern. But I don't think it does much good to give them an additional perpendicularity tolerance as I've done on other parts with pins. I'm just gonna work with the 0.2523 virtual condition and I'm gonna call the three pins a datum pattern of features, datum n. This is a three degree of freedom secondary datum to say the least. And now let's have a look at the mating part. This is the one with the cool crosshairs, GDTG00444. I gotta tell you, this is a pretty clean drawing and I don't hate it. Check out this call out for the three slots that are meant to be close fitting over the pins. This call out has zero position at MMC. And since it only references datum A primary, it should be thought of as controlling those slot widths as a pattern. The MMC, the lower size limit, 2528, is only 5 tenths larger than the pin VC. And since we're zero position at MMC, the 0.2528 is also the VC, so we're guaranteed to fit. All right, so these slot widths have two thousandths of size limit, and there's some chance they could be made at the LMC size of 0.2548. Meanwhile, we could theoretically have small pins 0.2501 in the exact position. So that's 4.7 thousandths of possible clearance. Some of us might look at that and say, well, that's pretty good. But in the ultra micro realm of thermal expansion, it might not be good enough. And all you can do is adjust the numbers to end up with narrower slots. But all of these features need to have tolerance, and now you should be under no illusions about that. You can keep tightening the tolerances, but at some point you will exceed your manufacturing capability and the parts won't fit. Okay, just to wrap up this drawing, you can see that the three slot widths are a datum pattern of features, which I then reference in the screw clearance slots and elsewhere. Okay, I have one and a half more examples to show you which will very thankfully wrap up the planned videos in this series. And you will see that these are of a different type. 
I'm reaching all the way back to the beginning to return to this adjustable mirror and this idea of repeatability. All along, I've tried to emphasize that the pins, holes, and slots are features of size. The pins are very precise features of size, and the holes and slots can be quite precise. Nevertheless, as features of size, they must have tolerance. They must be calculated to ensure fit, and by their nature, they will have some allowance, some repeatability error. But what if we use the pins not as features of size? With this interface, we place the mirror assembly down with this slot over a little center dowel pin. Then we load it up against these two dowel pins and we tighten the screws. We should end up with a highly repeatable angularity for this mount. Sure, the tertiary location is still controlled by features of size, the slot and the pin, but any allowance there should produce only minor secondary deviations on the angle of the mirror. Let's look at the drawing for this pin interface detail, GDTG00447. Even though this interface works great to constrain us in six degrees of freedom, I'm not sure there's a great way to express it in GDNT. Look at what I'm having to do with these first two dowel pins. All of this should be familiar up to the perpendicularity callout. Possibly there should be a diameter in here, so we're talking about the axis perpendicularity. But I decided to get a little creative with this 2x tangent edges note, because I don't need the entire pin to be super perpendicular. Just the line elements where they contact the next part. And then when it comes to the datum reference, I have a similar problem. It's not the cylindrical features of the pins per se which locate my part, only these tangent edges of contact. In this case, I decided that communicating my intent is more important than making our more familiar callouts. So I went in and I drew this big thick phantom line, tangent to the pins, and I call it my datum end feature. There could be a good argument that I should have used datum targets in there, and maybe not the phantom line. I'm at the limit of my ability. Let me know what you think. And now just briefly on this mating part. This is GDTG00455. The datum targets work really well here. One thing I want to point out is that in the datum references, on this part and in the last part, the secondary datum is not a feature of size, and there is no material boundary modifier. So this could be a high repeatability way to locate parts, but maybe with a few compromises. Like, what if the person assembling this doesn't read the instructions and they don't load the mirror assembly against the pins when they tighten the screws? Or what if when we tighten the screws, the base plate shifts a little and now we have a small gap between the base plate and one of the pins? Or what if we do thermal cycling on this and then we see a gap emerge and we lose alignment on the mirror? Well, I think about those things too. And in some of these special cases, more design is needed. And this is where we would enter into a new realm of high repeatability kinematic mounting techniques. Here I have two screws at an angle to load the base plate against the pins. I'm limiting the preload with the conical washers and the standoffs, and I'll try to reduce the friction at the interface. There are all kinds of things we can do with tapers and conical features, springs, interference fits, etc. But this is the end of a series of videos about a more common use of dowel pins, and it's not a deep dive into kinematic mounting. And thank goodness, because I really need to wrap this thing up. Of course, it hasn't all been about dowel pins, has it? Through this, you should have also been exposed to a lot of other techniques and calculations that go into dimensioning and tolerance. I hope you've absorbed a lot along the way, and that it will help you in your work. Because the real goal of all this, my real goal, is not just to talk abstractly about numbers and symbols, it's to make all of us better designers and better communicators. GD&T Guy, signing out.